Good evening. Lovely to be here. Lovely to see so many of you here on this balmy evening in the centre of London. Um, we are going to have a pretty informal discussion, hopefully an informative one, with my very esteemed panel here this evening. I'm just going to briefly go over the format uh, as it exists, which is we will all we will all talk amongst ourselves to you for about an hour, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I promise I will leave a reasonable amount of time for questions at the end. But let me introduce the panel. First of all, Tim Montgomery, to my right, maybe appropriately, um, founder of Conservative Home. Miranda Green, the Financial Times journalist and former Lib Dem advisor. John Rental, chief political commentator for The Independent. And of course, Professor Anand Menon, director of the UK in a changing Europe. Let's give them a round of applause just to get started. <laughs> Now, since it was such a quiet weekend in terms of the Conservative leadership contest, I thought I'd park that just at the beginning. And we want to talk about some of the reflections and thoughts since the EU referendum all those years ago in 2016. So I wanted to start by asking my panel, first of all, how would you describe now, sitting here, the state of British politics, Tim? Oh, that's a big one to start with. I think it's placid. I think it's all working out really well. <laughs> <laughs> Tory party, very strong, very united. <laughs> yeah, all, all going to plan, I think. Um, no, I um, obviously Brexit hasn't been delivered, but just talking to Miranda about um, the problem as well, it's um, the, the, the great problem I think we have is that we're divided as a nation about much more than Brexit now because of this whole Brexit thing. And um, I think Mary Beard um, recently explained uh, in, a, in a tweet why she was opposed to Brexit. And it was because, in her explanation, that Britain had never really come to terms with the fact that it's now a middle-ranking... I'm paraphrasing here, but I think it was essentially Britain had never really come to terms with the fact that it was a middle-ranking power and needed to be larger, part of something larger. Now, I've, I am, I'm a Brexiteer. I, I thoroughly disagree with that position. I think Britain's still a special nation with a special future ahead of itself that can survive outside of the, of the EU. I think both of those positions are defensible, but I think in that sort of simplification of why some people voted for Brexit and still support Brexit, other people voted for Remain and still support Remain, there is a fundamentally different, deep view about... Britain's role in the world and our potential. And I think that's why, despite all of the debates about the you know, precise nature of the relationship we have with the EU in the future, why public opinion is actually quite stable. And I think what Remain and the Leave debate has shown up is actually some fundamental underlying divisions about how we see ourselves. And um, they probably existed before, and everything has been exposed and revealed rather than created. But they are really deep differences when we drill down in them. And I've long thought a realignment was coming in British politics. I've thought the Conservative and Labour parties, Liberal Democrats, don't really capture some of the underlying realities. And I think as time goes by, um, that's going to be seen more and more. And... So even after, even if we manage to solve in some way the EU-British question, uh, the fallout in terms of political identification, where most of us, I think, now feel three times, according to opinion polls, more likely to identify with Brexit or Remain as we do as Tory or Labour, that fallout has a long way to travel. John? Um. Yeah, well, I agree. I agree with all that. I'm sorry, I'm not um, Phil Collins, by the way. Um, there was obviously something in the air tonight. Uh, oh. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> well done. Uh, uh, I I look back at um, uh, I, I remember uh, the referendum night, and uh, I, I remember um, seeing the opinion polls at uh, at ten o'clock, uh, seeing Nigel Farage concede. <laughs> uh, and thinking that I would, the sensible thing to do would be to go to bed and to get up at four o'clock in the morning. And then, of course, the first results started coming in, and uh, and, and they were more leavey than uh, than remaining. Um, and I remember um, thinking, I mean, so obviously I stayed up for the whole the whole night. Uh, and I do remember the BBC was very reluctant 
to recognise that Leave had won. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. yeah. It, 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 took them, it took them ages. I mean, it was obvious that Leave had won by about sort of two or three in the morning, uh, and yet the BBC wouldn't uh, wouldn't accept it until uh, until the early hours of the morning. And I thought that was indicative of a problem because although you know I was unlike Tim a Remainer, I was a very reluctant Remainer, and I could see the arguments for for leaving. And I actually. Um, since the referendum, I've wanted to leave, and I think we should leave. But uh, what I could not have foreseen in the early hours of uh, the 24th of June uh, 2016 was that Brexit would be destroyed by the purest Brexiteers themselves. Mm. And I think that is the most extraordinary thing yeah. that's happened in the past three years. Anand? Uh, Brexit has done something odd to our politics. And actually, that was really summarised for me by Tim. Just before the 2017 election, I remember reading something by you that was in The Sun about what Theresa May should, should, should do when she secures this massive majority that everyone thought she was going to secure at the time. I mean, you know, I've always liked Tim's stuff. I don't, I've never thought of ourselves as sort of political soulmates. So I read this thing and realised to my dismay that I agreed with every word of it. <laughs> so, which, was the, which, which actually brought home to me very, very profoundly just how... The, the, the centre of gravity of politics had shifted so profoundly because I think one of, the, one of the things that has happened because of Brexit, and you saw it in some of the shifts in that 2017 referendum, is the two big parties no longer really know who they're for anymore. Mm. And yet they did, of course, win between them. No, no, absolutely. But actually now, if you think about it, what is the priority of the Labour Party? Is it to keep is it to guard Kensington or to retake Mansfield? That's a very, very profound question. Uh, and it speaks to one of the problems there is in politics at the moment, is that no one knows who they're targeting their message at, which makes it hard to have a message at all. Except, of course, the Liberal Democrats, um, Miranda, who have always been very clear in terms of Remain in the Brexit aftermath about where they stood. It took them a bit of a while to actually get much support, but they are now gaining. Um, but to some extent, they still haven't made quite enough headway in order to challenge the other two main parties. Um, so I think it's interesting, this, because the Liberal Democrats, who have always been seen as a somewhat wishy-washy, split-the-difference centrist party, well, in their weaker moments anyway, by their harshest critics, um, are now sort of the only beneficiaries, really, of the peculiar changes that we're seeing, and they're actually beneficiaries of the polarisation over Brexit. Um, you know, whether that's a temporary or a permanent thing remains to be seen, but, you know, the polarisation that Tim was alluding to, I think is very, very profound and, in a way, quite worrying because it seems to bring with it some kind of US imports of culture war, which I think we want to try and put a break on if we can, quite urgently. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also accelerated, as Anand has said, this kind of historical decline in the traditional voter support base for the two mm -hmm. main, main parties, which, you know, you're absolutely <coughs> right, Joe. The 2017 election was extraordinary in terms of kind of 80-plus percent mm -hmm. combined vote, vote share for kind of Team Red and Team Blue. But over time, that's not really what's been going on. That's not the trend. And then Brexit has seemed to kind of accelerate that. With, we don't yet know whether 2017 was a blip or you know, whether if we have another general election sooner rather than later. I mean, my feeling is you might well get quite a polarised result again simply because you have that negative voting pattern. If you have Corbyn versus Johnson, for example, you may get people voting to stop the one that they, they, they dislike most, which sort of le lends itself to, to that, rather than the more fractured voting patterns that we saw in the European elections recently, for example. But I do think that very profound things have been going on and that it's changed. And I don't think it uh, dates from the referendum, all of it. I mean, if you mm. think of the financial crash mm. and the recession which followed it, if you think of the expenses scandal, so that's 20, 2008, 2009, I think this was building anyway and building over quite a long period of time in terms of whether there was actually sufficient consent about the way we're governed and about the economic settlement. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then Brexit has kind of accelerated everything and made everything much more febrile and much more emotionally charged, which 
is a problem, I think. But to bring up Anand's point about having two parties <laughs> whose leaderships didn't reflect properly either their MPs to some extent, particularly with the Labour Party, with what most people feel is a Eurosceptic leader who may now be pushed <coughs> to announce tomorrow that he is not only going to back um, a, a referendum on any deal, but also going to back Remain, but probably unenthusiastically, and a Conservative Party led by Theresa May with a deal that she couldn't get enough support behind. How did that end, it, it, you end up being the case that neither leadership of the two big parties seem to lose authority in terms of bringing them with them? Well, one answer, I mean, the, core, the, the, the May answer, I think, lies in the fact that basically the middle has been hollowed out of the Brexit debate. Uh, you know, one of the most amazing things you've seen over the last few months are the savage attacks launched on each other by proponents of a Norway outcome and proponents of Remain, mm. who sort of, you know, during the referendum campaign, they were all on the same side, but all of a sudden, you know, there's been a desperate attempt to sort of hollow things out, so we're left with no deal versus no Brexit as the two things, and that, that means that compromise is very, very hard, and actually public opinion reflects that now, is that I think... You know, a significant proportion of Leavers as their preferred option is no deal. A significant proportion of Remainers as their preferred option is no Brexit. Has anyone changed their mind over Brexit or Remain in any way since the referendum out of you lot? No. So well, you it depends stayed... what you mean by change your mind. I mean, I, I, I accept the result of the referendum and wanted it to be implemented. Um, although, you know, before the referendum, I was with Theresa May. I thought that the economic argument and the argument about uh, keeping Scotland in the Union... Uh, was enough to tilt the balance the other way. But everybody else has stayed the same, despite what we know now, which we perhaps didn't know at the time. I mean, what do you feel we've learned since 2016 that has reinforced, then, the view you had at the time? Well... <laughs> Not very much. <laughs> no, I think, I, think, I think we've actually learned a lot, but... Mm. but, but they're difficult lessons and, and, you know, I don't know about everyone else, but you sort of struggle with your own prejudices a lot, actually, because a lot of what's come to the fore is this sort of identity politics that yeah, the Tim described, the, yeah. cult, the culture war. And I think, I mean, you know, I, I tend to agree uh, with my colleagues to your left, Joe, rather than with Tim on the sort of fundamentals of Brexit in that, you know, I voted Remain. I believe that Britain's future ought to have continue to be in the EU, but perhaps not exactly where we had been. And I think what should have happened after the referendum is actually that David Cameron should not have resigned immediately. Well, and he that should wouldn't have, have gone down very well, would it? Well, I don't actually, no. I, don't actually <laughs> I don't actually think that I don't actually think that one of our I think many of the kind of mores of modern politics are unhelpful. And I think the convention now that when people have messed up, they just walk away from the mess is very unhelpful. And I think that's a good example of it because actually I think you, you should have looked at the referendum result and you should have said, we've got a real problem. We've got a completely divided nation on, on our future relations with our closest allies, closest trading partners, etc. And you could have over time come up with a different relationship and so I agree with Anand. I think this hollowing out of any sort of compromise solution has been one of the most negative developments over the last three years. Theresa May did stick around, um, and there were many who felt perhaps she shouldn't have stuck around as long as she did. Mm. But do you agree with John that it was the Brexiteers to the right, even on the Brexit question, that to some extent have ruined this? Completely. Completely. And... Um, uh, back to really where I started, one of the saddest things for me about this whole thing is uh, losing friends might be overstating it, but um, I back the withdrawal agreement. I, I've been probably one of the most consistent critics of Theresa May. I think she's messed up in many respects, but I thought when you got to the stage of five to midnight, you had to back what the prime minister you'd kept in office had negotiated. And I've regarded myself as one of the staunchest Brexiteers over the last few years, I've been on your programme often enough, you know, defending Brexit. But people have, you know, talked about me in terms of sellout and betrayal and, you know, all these sorts of um, concepts. And I suppose one of the learnings to answer your question, uh, Joe, is, and Jacob Rees-Mogg has expressed this, I think I've probably realised that Brexit is a process, not an event. Mm. That, you know, a 44-year-old marriage isn't going to be ended in one moment. 
um, we're going to leave this, I still hope we are, we're going to leave this relationship over time. And actually it might be a little bit of a, you know, we might move back in some way and move closer at, at some point. There will be a, a negotiation in our position over, over a number of years. But in terms of regret, you mentioned Theresa May, and I completely agree with what Miranda said about you have to see this event in the context of you know, the crash and other events that happened. Is Theresa May, I thought she really got it when on her first day as Prime Minister, she gave that speech when she said she would tackle the injustices of our time. And I know Labour friends who thought, oh my goodness, we're up against something really formidable here. And then, of course, nothing happened. Almost nothing happened. And I knew nothing would happen as soon as I saw that she was appointing Philip Hammond as her chancellor. <laughs> if you appoint Philip Hammond, you know, one of the most cautious people in politics as your chancellor, nothing is going to happen. He's um, coming for a lot of stick, hasn't he, Philip Hammond? Yeah, um, and deservedly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the long list of Theresa May's worst decisions, appointing <laughs> him would be up there. But there was a possibility that the, the, I definitely underestimated the commitment of Remain voters, or a large percentage of them, to continue to fight for Remain after the referendum result. But if Theresa May had delivered on a national project, if she had said, you know, my government and meant that her government was going to tackle the North-South divide, that was going to do things for uh, the gender pay gap, was really actually going to take some action, um, then maybe people would have thought, including in the Conservative Party who were Remainers, people like Anna Subri thought, well, maybe I don't agree with this government's central project, but there's enough good things, important, useful things happening here in response to that demand for a reset from voters that I can stay loyal to this. But I think the, one of the reasons why the divisions have got so deep is because it's only been Brexit. Because we have such a control freak in number 10 who hasn't empowered other departmental ministers to undertake other reforms, I think it has been such a narrowed, narrowed agenda and a narrow politics where we only identify as Remainers or Leavers. Was it wrong to trigger Article 50 as quickly as Theresa May decided to put it? it was, she triggered it too late. I mean, she should have triggered it much earlier. Um, what she, I mean, the fatal mistake she made was to lose momentum because by triggering it um, when she did, what was it, March? Mm. So that was sort of nine months after. Well, of course, the, it was delayed the by the court case to some extent, yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, the court case was a yeah. complete waste of everybody's time and money. Um, but so, so says you. But this is one of the huge problems with, with, with Brexit, was the loss of momentum and the fact that, you know, once two, two years and nine months had gone past, people had forgotten about the referendum and, and, and they'd forgotten all the things they'd said immediately after the referendum about how we must respect the, the decision of the British people. In terms, yes, go on, Randy. Sorry, but is it is it loss of momentum? I mean, is that quite fair? Is it loss of momentum, or is it the total absence of a of a plan? Well, she had a plan. I mean, she had a perfectly good plan, which was to get out of the EU. I mean, uh, you know, and, and she negotiated a withdrawal agreement, and she didn't need all that time to negotiate but, it. But, but surely, one of the reasons why Leave won was a brilliantly constructed coalition of people who wanted all sorts of different things mm. deliberately ambiguous and so then if you win almost by accident and you are Boris Johnson and uh, Michael Gove on the morning after you've won looking there ashen faced <laughs> as you realise you're now responsible for delivering it you've got a serious problem haven't you because you haven't had a plan. Well I mean Gisela Stewart I was with her on the night in Manchester when the announcement was made cautiously by the BBC um, <laughs> that we were, as you say, John, that we were out. She was ashen-faced because she never quite believed, I think, that, that they were going to win. And the first interview we did with Liam Fox afterwards was blaming the government for not having a plan um, for leaving because David Cameron had to some extent presumed that yeah. Remain was going to win. Um, how much has that held back the developments and the negotiations that there wasn't in place already all sorts of things that would have facilitated us leaving the EU? Well, I suppose the civil service could have wargamed it a little bit. I mean, but what the civil service couldn't have known is what the government would have looked like given that Cameron was going to go. I mean, I think one of the dangerous things of the nine months, and on Theresa May, we often forget the immense pressure she found herself under the trigger by the time she got to March. I mean, it wasn't something that she entered into happily, but I think she was facing real accusations from her right of sort of betraying Brexit by then. But those nine months gave both sides 
the opportunity to really entrench their positions. And I think that's what happened, mm -hmm. because back in the first summer after the referendum, I think there was space for a compromise where you had Remainers who were willing to say, OK, look, we lost, so we need to find some comfort, and equally on the Leave side. But I think in those nine months, what happened is both sides basically planted their flags miles away from each other. Uh, and so by the time we triggered, there was that sort of, the, the, yeah. you know, the basis of where we As are As I've now. always said, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn was absolutely right. In on what everything. sense? About on everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> I say that daily. On the morning after the referendum, he I said, we must, we, we must trigger Article 50 now. And there's been mm. this scholarly dispute about what the now meant in that sentence. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but he was right that we should have triggered it straight away. I don't know what other panellists think, and I, I certainly didn't have a clear view on this at the time. But in retrospect, I think it was a mistake that the Tory party put a uh, remainer in charge yeah. rather than a... A lever. Now, obviously, I think if you had a lever in charge, you would have had more accountability. Um, but also, um, I spent a lot of my formative years in Bielefeld, in um, northwest Nordrhein Westphalia, in Germany. And straight after the referendum, um, you know, I had friends from Bielefeld saying, you know, why have you deserted us? Why have you left us? Why have you rejected Europe? And I, was made, I made an argument that we needed a sort of a declaration of love for Europe. And, make, and I talked to David Liddington, who was completely persuaded by it. But he said to me, Theresa May won't do it. She's worried about upsetting Brexiteers. I think and, I, and I think she was always hammed in by that. I think false sense of what leavers wanted. I think she overemphasized Im immigration as part of why the leave Which isn't discussed happens. very much at all these days. <laughs> no. yeah. and, and it used um, to be the thing we talked about every single day. Yeah. And uh, the fundamental problem, I think, with, with why I think her... Uh, Premiership has failed on the Brexit front is she always saw um, Brexit as a risk minimization exercise rather than an opportunity maximization exercise. She never really bought into the spirit of Brexit. And um, I think it would have been better for all sorts of reasons. The Leavers could have owned the mess or owned the success or whatever. But I think having a, having a, uh, a remainer in charge was a big part of the problem. Do you think she would have been better advised at bringing the country together if she hadn't made that speech about the somewheres and nowheres, the 52 and the 48, uh, where she the emphasised the where she emphasised the differences between yeah, the two? I, I think she, I agree absolutely with Tim that it was problematic having a Remainer as a Prime Minister who spent the first year proving her credentials to the European Research Group, and I think. Had you had, say, a Michael Gove, someone who led the Leave campaign in position, then by a sort of only Nixon can go to China sort of logic, they might have found it easier to come up with some compromised Brexit than she did. But I think the Tory party conference was a, was a series of awful mistakes, because there wasn't just the citizens of nowhere speech, there was the registration of EU citizens speech by Amber Rudd, and there was also the red lines she put down. And remember, all this happened before she'd had any formal interaction with the other EU member states. She hadn't been to a European Council before that conference. So they watched this in horror, and it shaped their perceptions of it. And what about relations with the Labour Party? Would it have been different with a different leader in charge of the Labour Party in terms of getting some sort of collaboration between Theresa May and someone leading Labour over Brexit? I think it probably would have been more difficult to, to reach out to the Labour Party under a, under a less Eurosceptic... Labour leader. I mean, people always say, oh, well, you know, Theresa May should have, should have reached out to the Labour Party uh, earlier, yeah. um, which, I mean, she should in abstract, but if she had, she would have gone. I mean, she, she, she would, they, they would have moved against her straight away and got rid of her because the Conservatives just hated, hated any idea that they were sort of capitulating to a Labour agenda. And then, also, what Prime Minister with a majority comes into power and says, I'm going to go and chat to the opposition now? I mean, it's just, that's just not our political Well, a, confi country, a confident one. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> Except what about leader. those Labour leavers who, and the Labour leave MPs who said they would come on board if they had been given an opportunity earlier? I mean, there were 26 of them who were supposedly going to sign up. Three, yeah. in the end, voted for that withdrawal agreement. If there had been more collaboration with the Labour Party, could she have got that deal done? And could it still go through with now Labour support, some version of Theresa May's deal? No. Why not? Because they're not going to come over now. I mean, that's it. I mean, and the idea that Boris Johnson is going to win over... Labour MPs that Theresa May couldn't persuade is for the birds. I mean, you know, Boris Johnson's even more toxic as far as Labour 
uh, Labour people are concerned. So I'm, I'm not so sure about that, actually. Um, I mean, partly just because nobody's sure about anything. <laughs> well, that's true. I really, I really, no, no, but I mean, I, I, I really do think we should, we should emphasise that because, you know, the dynamic shifts really quickly at the moment. And, you know, with a new Prime Minister coming in, I, I accept your point totally about Boris, Boris's toxicity. And it's true that the Labour Party as a sort of corporate entity is now totally obsessed since the Scottish referendum with not sharing a platform with anybody else and not having relations with anybody else because they considered it so, so damaging to them in Scotland in 2014. But even so, I think some of those Labour Leave MPs really feel they've burnt their bridges with the corporate entity of the Labour Party, actually. So I, I, yeah. I wouldn't be quite so confident that they wouldn't, you know, on the as, as it gets into October and it's looking mm. once again like mm. unbelievably high stakes game of chicken, you know, no deal or revoke even, which is the situation we could be in. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them peeled off actually and supported a deal. Stephen Kinnock said today, if the withdrawal agreement looks pretty well like the one Theresa May put forward with the changes that Labour asked for, he'll vote for it. He didn't before, but he will vote for it now. It may be that by the time we get to October 31st, different things will be in play. <laughs> but if we have a look at Parliament and delivering a referendum, was that always going to be impossible? Do people think that a parliamentary democracy finds it in incredibly hard to actually execute a decision of leave and remain in this case in the EU referendum? I think in, in hindsight you can say um, it was almost impossible <coughs> to deliver Brexit uh, in the British political system because the two parties would divide, um, the Conservatives would never vote for a Labour Brexit and the Labour MPs would never vote for a Conservative Brexit and if you've got a a, a close to hung parliament, which is what we've had, mm. you know, neither side is going to be able to construct a majority for it. And that, looking back, you could see how that, uh, that was always going to be the case. Mm. I mean, I think it was, it was, but I mean, she was only 30 votes short uh, on, the, on the last attempt. So, you know, it was probably possible to 58, do... 58, actually, I if think. If things had happened differently. So well, no, 58 was the majority, so... If so she, oh, if 30, I see what you mean. I see, yes, the other fair way, enough, she, yeah. And, and, she could I, have done I think it. I share John's scepticism about... You know, it, was the, it was the Rory Stewart position that um, you know, he would try and get the withdrawal agreement through again, and um, I think that was always going to be uphill. But the one thing that has changed, and I think it's a bigger change than Boris potentially becoming Prime Minister, is you know, we have had the European elections where both of the main parties have been reduced to uh, levels, of, yeah, <laughs> levels of support that they would not have even contemplated a month before that election happened and the rise of is it still your party in Brando am I allowed to the Liberal Democrats you, you can say what you want <laughs> <laughs> the rise of the Liberal Democrats anyway and so and the Brexit party yeah and, and the Brexit party. the fear of God now um, has been put into lots of MPs who perhaps might abstain or vote for the withdrawal agreement um, in a way they wouldn't have before now I think nearly all of the scenarios uh, talking to John about this is I think I wouldn't attach more than 15%, 20% probability to anything. You know, it's all hard to see how anything really happens. But something hopefully will happen. And I would put some sort of uh, cosmetic uh, restatement of the withdrawal agreement passing at something like 20%. I think that's a possible outcome because mm. the electoral context has changed. Not, not a little bit, massively. <coughs> the, a lot of MPs, particularly in northern leave seats, are scared stiff about facing an early general election. Right. Wouldn't this speak to, just quickly, wouldn't this speak to a complete and utter cock-up by those Labour MPs? Mm. Because actually, had they supported the withdrawal agreement on the 29th of March, mm. the withdrawal agreement that the party line was to support, mm. had they got this through and out of the way, they could have supported a lamed-up Tory Prime Minister rather than a brand-new spanking one. Yeah. They could have got this out of the way. The Tories would have changed their leader anyway. They could have avoided the debacle of the European elections. And now they're going to have to do what they didn't do then under far worse circumstances. I mean, that just, that's just a nightmare, isn't it? Well, yeah. we'll talk about the scenarios um, in a moment because there are many of those. And actually, I agree with Tim to some extent. There's some version, because I had a bet a long time ago, <laughs> that Theresa May's deal would eventually pass, um, you know, whatever <laughs> happened. Does it count uh, as a different uh, font? Yes, and if right. it's slightly different, it might still pass. So I'm still uh, hanging on, hang on, really not, much, not very much. Um, it, it's a private matter anyway, um, as Boris <laughs> Johnson would say. Anymore. As Boris Johnson would say. Um, but talking about Europe and our relationship with the EU, when you look back now over the last three years, how would you describe the state of that relationship, Miranda? 
Um, <laughs> yes. Crap, the gentleman over there says. Um, I think that's a fair comment. Uh, no, we, ha we, ha we have damaged our relations with the rest of Europe. I don't think there's any question about that. And it's partly been the spectacle of sort of, you know, well-respected civil servants who have dealt with them over years being sort of publicly humiliated and fired when they offered tiny little suggestions that things might not be as simple as they'd seemed on the... 22nd of, of, of June when they were, you know, the pitch believe was being made. Um, and it's partly also just the way the, the negotiations have been conducted. I mean, you know, the idea of a Prime Minister going back again and again to these European summits, unable to say whether she's got the agreement of the DUP for what she's proposing to our allies. Yeah. I mean, absolute incredulity by our European allies, really, that business could be have been conducted on that basis. Um, you know, I think probably all of us have been through a bit of a kind of emotional roller coaster. I certainly know I have of moments of intense kind of sympathy for May at the appalling position that she's been in. I mean, you know, absolutely. You know, a lot of it self-inflicted, of course. A lot of it self-inflicted, but. You know, she, she's been humiliated repeatedly, and we've all been humiliated through her humiliation, and and that's a sort of bad place to be. I think when you think about what might happen in October, if we're throwing it forward to, if we are in a position of needing to ask for another extension, whether it's, you know, a few days because we're on the verge of agreement, which <laughs> tends to sound slightly comical to me, or a proper extension because we still haven't worked out what it is we're going to do. You know, last time round, Emmanuel Macron was extremely impatient. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, he's, he's not going to have got more impatient over the summer. Uh, you know, so the danger of even going back to asking for another extension uh, is, 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 has become worse, I think. Uh, I, th I mean, to be honest, and I don't know, I don't want Macron to be, my sense is that they will give us an extension because actually, in a curious sort of way, the EU have got the Britain they always wanted now, haven't they? We don't block anything, we don't veto anything, we don't propose anything, but we pay into the budget. <laughs> uh, and I think that situation ends abruptly in April, May, because in May they vote on their next financial mm. settlement for seven years. I think at that point, they're going to either they're going to say, make up your mind one or the other. But I think for the moment, we're all right. But just on the negotiations, and I'm not going to stand, I'm not going to defend the way that Theresa May carried out the negotiations, but I've been disappointed, I think, by the way both sides carried out the negotiations while staring fixedly at their own navels. Mm. So we carried out our side of the negotiation without any regard to what the Europeans might think of the way we were doing it and the, way, the language we were using. The European Union carried out the negotiations staring fixedly at its rule book with no regard to the partnership it wants to have mm -hmm. with a country that is an important ally. Yeah. I mean, for me, actually, this has just exemplified the problem the European Union has always had at dealing with neighbours that don't want to join. If it's enlargement, it's fine. They've got a process, it works, and it's been relatively smooth. If you're Ukraine, or if you're Turkey, or if you're now the United Kingdom, and there's an issue about joining, but you want a neighborhood agreement, it's been very sort of by the book, short term, with a complete, as we saw in the case of, of Ukraine, complete sort of naivety about geostrategy and geopolitics, that actually a good alliance between the European Union and the United Kingdom is important to both sides and will be going forward. And that hasn't played a role, I don't think, in the way the Article 50 No, I do agree with that. I think they've been very unflexible. And actually, I think, you know, the Northern Irish backstop, the question of, uh, you know, this disputed territory in the, inside the EU, they ought to have been a bit more sensitive, actually, I think, to, to the UK's issues with it. What do you think about the EU and the way they handled it? And this idea that the withdrawal agreement and the divorce had to come first before the wider trade relationship, which might have mitigated some of the issues around the Irish backstop. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the problem is the EU had the upper hand in the negotiations, mm -hmm. and um, I'm afraid it used, mm -hmm. used its upper hand fairly ruthlessly. Um, and, you know, you can't just sort of expect them to be nice just because... You know, mm. that would be nice. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I think you should actually. Nice. It was about, it was it about not recognising their own interests. Yeah. Mm. I think that, that, is, that, is possibly, that is possibly true. But does that mean they're going to change their approach now? I don't think they will on the backstop, no. I think maybe when we get, if, we, if we get into phase two of the negotiations, it might take a different sort of... I think, I think the great... Well, one of the great disappointments of the whole uh, Irish situation, and John might be, you might have strong views on this, but um, is the Good Friday Agreement was a really classic example of obfuscation 
of, you know, of not really trying to settle lots of things, leaving all sorts of things vague and you know, kick the can down the road. But, mm. but we wanted to reach an agreement we, that both sides wanted peace, but there was all sorts of specifics that people weren't willing to move on. That. And unfortunately, the EU just doesn't work like that. Everything has to be incredibly clear. And if somehow the EU had agreed, let Britain and Ireland Britain sort this really real issue out between themselves over years by a bilateral treaty that we will somehow supervise, we might have solved this. But I still really don't know how we're going to solve this because of the way the EU works and has to have everything so legally well, defined so you, early on. Would you trust Britain then to have dealt yeah, with precisely. this in the way... And also um, the Irish wanted that. They may not have wanted that, but that was how we have made peace in the past and it's been, continued to be how we've... You know, the Good Friday, there's still sorts of outstanding issues with the Good Friday mm. Agreement, but we sort of muddle through it somehow because of the history between our... Yeah. Very well, sad well, history between our two For good nations. reasons, we should say, you know, the constructive ambiguity approach was for very good reasons. Yes. So, yeah. 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 No, I'm not, I'm not criticising yeah. it, I'm saying... No, well, Tony yeah. Blair would have been better at negotiating the withdrawal agreement than Theresa May. I would completely yeah. agree, with, well, you, yeah. agree with you there. <laughs> <laughs> You're praising Tony Blair, I would never, <laughs> never have thought it, John. Tim, <laughs> um, does any of this, though, lend itself to looking seriously at the idea of a second referendum? Um, Miranda. Oh, God, the second referendum. So, so Tim talked about sort of losing friends. I also have almost not quite lost <laughs> friends on the subject of a second referendum. It's very Everybody, lonely, isn't it, being oh, a political commentator? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> you know, so as time goes on, it becomes one of the options that seems more likely just because we reach some sort of impasse. And also, again, as we've said before, you know, you have an incoming new prime minister, maybe the dynamic slightly changes. And of course, having a referendum is a great way of delegating responsibility to the electorate if things get too, mm. too difficult. Um, you know, I don't, I don't look forward to such an event whatsoever. <laughs> I'd quite like to, 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 I'd probably vote for any party that said we'll never have another, another referendum ever again on it, on anything. <laughs> But, um, you know, it is one of the ways of potentially putting some sort of punctuation mark on this appalling period that we've been, we've been living through. So, I mean, we can't dismiss it out of hand. My, my worry is that you get, you know, 52, 48 the other way or whatever. Well, of course, and we'll never know the, the result. The exactly, we're not the end of the story. Potentially on a much lower turnout than the first one. Exactly. Yeah. And there are huge questions of legitimacy of that. Then. So, you know, there's a can of worms. Yes. But, but what would it mean? I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about people have changed their minds. Actually, the polls indicate that it's too difficult to call whether many people have changed their minds. Would there be more support now to remain within the EU on the basis of what we know now? What do you think, John? I mean, would it be a strategy or um, an event that you would well, back? It depends, what the question, it depends what the question is. And obviously, I have to say that the Independent is strongly uh, in support of a final say referendum. Uh, I don't agree with it. But, right. Which just shows how pluralist and, uh, and, and tolerant the independent <laughs> is and, uh, and hey. allows me to express my contrary view. But actually, I, I've been coming round to, to the idea that you know, a referendum is actually in, it probably uh, in a, well, not, not necessarily inevitable. But I mean, if Brexit is not going to happen, mm. then you know, that means, which I don't think it is, I mean, I don't think we're going to leave. Um, then I think at some point there has to be there has to be a referendum to to put an end to that to that process. But um, I mean that could be, that could be in twenty in in, in, in twenty thirty or something. Oh right. Well, I was thinking of a referendum <laughs> perhaps a little sooner than that. Anand, my if I had to guess on an outcome of this, it would be an election. Uh, you know, I still can't shake the feeling that Prime Minister Johnson walks into Downing Street, looks at the state of Parliament, and thinks. That looks like a really awful job. And goes to the people saying, give me a mandate to do Brexit for you. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, that election, could lead, to that election could lead to two referendums. Uh, because if, if, the, if Labour come to power on the back of a sort of Lib Dem SNP coalition, it will be on the back of promising not only an EU referendum, but an Indy yeah, Ref 2 yeah, as well. Yeah. So it might not be a way of preventing a referendum. That depends on how it, how it goes. I think, you know, everything that's been said about a referendum, I agree with, it might end up being the only way out of this mess. But the notion that it would... I mean, if it's a punctuation mark, my fear is it's a hyphen. 
Uh, a semi colon. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you grammarians, you. <laughs> that you end up in a situation where you have 52-48 on a lower turnout with, because, you know, Remain will get more votes than either of the two leave options. All right? And that's the problem with a referendum, is that if you take no deal plus deal, it's fairly neck and neck. I mean, Remain is ahead, but it's quite close. If you take either of those two, if you had a referendum that was the deal versus Remain, then you would have an abstention campaign by the people who want no deal. And that would undermine the legitimacy of the thing from the start. Well, let me put this scenario. We might as well do the scenarios that might happen because they're going to come along fairly quickly. I mean, there is more talk gathering that Boris Johnson might actually go for a second referendum because of fears that going to the country before delivering Brexit means that the Tories would be punished mm -hmm. um, and punished very hard, whereas he could come in and say, actually, we'll have another referendum and I will campaign and the government will campaign for leave, either no deal or some sort of um, agreement that he has made and that he will campaign alongside, not with uh, Nigel Farage and the Brexit party, and that Remain would would not have a strong enough figurehead to leave it and he'd take a risk and a gamble and he might go for that. That, what do you think of that scenario, Tim? Um, well, I hope he doesn't go down that route and I, I, I don't think he will and n not just because of, you know, what it might mean for Brexit but, you know, we, it would just be so horrible. You know, it would be, it would be the, li <laughs> the leave side would be saying the political class are a bunch of lying, deceiving mm. so-and-sos. Mm. Um, <laughs> you're a very rowdy corner over there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, um, <laughs> the, um, the Remain side would be, you know, particularly if Boris was the figurehead of it, would be saying they're a bunch of liars who deceived you about why we should leave in the first place. And so who, no one would win. You know, the country would, the country's divided enough, and I, I just can't see, particularly because I don't know what question you could put on that ballot paper that could command legitimacy. Would Parliament vote that through? Well, that's the other thing. I mean, Parliament would have to pass the legislation yeah, providing yeah. for the referendum, and it would have to decide what the question would be, and would Parliament, current, as currently constituted, uh, accept no deal hmm. exit as, a, as one of the options on a referendum. I mean, that's an, op that's an open question. I mean, even Tony Blair says that you've got to have a no deal exit on, mm. the, on the ballot paper. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't have, the, the mm. referendum result wouldn't have legitimacy. But uh, I'm not sure that Parliament would accept that argument. Do you, not, do you not think that some of those arguments by strong Remainers to have no deal on the ballot paper are tactical, though? I mean, when I've heard Tony Blair talk about that. I've thought, well, this is this, 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 this is like high stakes, high stakes, high stakes, higher <laughs> stakes. Let's raise them even further, rather than actually thinking it hmm. was a question of. I do accept the legitimacy point actually, because like, and, and I think if you have a boycott of a plebiscite, you're in real trouble when you then compare it to the 2016 vote and a 70% turnout. You know. So what difference do we think it'll make if Jeremy Corbyn does tomorrow, after a shadow cabinet meeting, come forward and say, we are obviously in favour, as they've already said, of a referendum on any agreed deal, but we will campaign to remain? Will that, have any different, will that make any difference at all? I don't think that really changes Boris Johnson's calculations as he comes into Downing Street. I mean, I completely agree with Anand. I think... I think, I think Boris Johnson's only sensible course is to, is to fight an immediate general election. But, I mean, to, to expect an incoming prime minister to do that uh, is, uh, you know, it doesn't... It, Gordon Brown wouldn't do it. Um, Theresa May only did it very reluctantly after she was very high in the opinion polls after a long time, and look what happened to her. So, you know, and unless Boris, I mean, maybe Boris Johnson has this kind of Churchillian sense that he's a man of destiny who's going to take them the courageous decision <laughs> to go to the people and ask for a mandate to leave deal or no deal on October the 31st. Mm. Uh, but uh, you know, I wait, I mean, Tim knows him better than I do. So uh, you can tell us if that's what's going to happen over the summer. I think my, my summer holiday depends on this. <laughs> <laughs> I've cancelled mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're agreeing too much on this panel. Let me see if I can inject some disagreement into it. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think... I think Boris doesn't want his premiership to be defined by Brexit, um, and um, the, you know, the, the, the Boris that was she. the Boris no, the Boris that was London Mayor hasn't gone away. You know, he, I think we so define ourselves by Brexit and and, and remain now that I think we um, 
we only see Boris now. Oh, we've, got, we've got to call him Johnson, haven't yes. we? Yes, yes well, I have. Have. The, you the, don't the have to. Um, but we only see him in those terms. But actually, on gay marriage, on climate change, on a whole range of other issues, that Boris is still there. And he, 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 I think, understands that the long-term future for the Conservative Party is to be a one-nation uh, party. And one of the most interesting trends that are happening in the world at the moment is that left-wing voters, uh, the sort of better-off voters are moving left, poorer voters are moving right. It's why we have an Australian Conservative government just been re-elected. It's why uh, Pennsylvania is going to be a swing state in 10 years and Texas is going to be a Democrat state in 10 years. The geography across the world is changing. And um, I think Boris Johnson gets that and he needs to ride these trends and certain seats in the South are going to be lost and certain seats in the North and Midlands are going to become part of the Conservative column. And he needs time, I think, to demonstrate in tax, Northern powerhouse, project that George Osborne was probably his big triumph, very neglected by May. He wants to implement a whole range of things to show actually the Conservative Party is different. But he is going to have to do Brexit first, isn't he? Or not, as the case may be. He, he, and come, the, come October the 31st, let's imagine he is, he is elected and he is Prime Minister and he makes it through to the summer and he, let's say he does get a change in the negotiations to the backstop. And the one scenario is that's enough. Yep. And he manages to sell it as a wholesale change, whether it is or not is by the by, and it goes through and Brexit is done. The other scenario is that he gets to October the 31st. He hasn't managed to change anything because the EU are sticking to their guns and he starts to say that we are going to head for no deal. Mm. We're already hearing today from Ken Clark and others that they will know confidence that government rather than allow no deal. So will Boris Johnson at that stage face a no confidence vote, um, which he could lose if there really are, as Tobias Elwood, another Tory MP in the panorama tonight, is saying mm. that there are a dozen, um, along with Labour, he may be the shortest or one of the shortest prime ministers in history. He is, and, and, and I repeat what I said earlier, Joe, that I think all scenarios are sort of in 15, 20% territory. But I think the likely scenario is that Boris gets a bounce in the opinion polls, um, enough to terrify the Labour Party of an early election, but not enough to tempt him to go for one. I think that's the scenario we're going to be in. And I think that's the sort of context where you get, might get quite a few ERG Tories abstaining, quite a few Labour MPs in leave seats abstaining, and possibly the withdrawal agreement passing. And I think the no-deal scenario you mentioned is absolutely the, the, the nightmare one for mm, him, and then you precipitate an election. But I think we might go out on a tweet withdrawal agreement, probably tweet political declaration. And it's, I, I, again, I, I think it's probably a 20%, 25% scenario, but I think it's the one that allows him then to do what I think he really wants to do, which is relaunch the Conservative Party. Right. I mean, what, what about this no deal issue? Because that is what is being discussed um, rightly, because it is a, a, pro a possible scenario by the end of October. And Boris Johnson hasn't, none of them have explained, now it's him and Jeremy Hunt, exactly how you get over that issue and whether Parliament really can say no to no deal. Yeah, I think if, par if Parliament's sitting in September, um, I think, I think people will be very worried about that and will be taking uh, steps to prevent it happening. I mean, there's obviously the difficulty that they lost that vote on the Labour motion mm -hmm. uh, recently. Uh, they didn't have enough votes to take control of the parliamentary timetable. But I think in September, things would look very different because then by then Boris Johnson would actually be Prime Minister. Uh, a no-deal exit would look like a real possibility. And I think... Um, I, I, I don't know what, how they will do it, but I think they will find a way of legislating from the backbenches to um, prevent Boris Johnson from proroguing Parliament and to uh, instruct him to go to Brussels and ask for an extension but, if there's no deal. But doesn't that sort of standoff just make an election more likely? I mean, that, isn't that just an ideal situation to then, you know, go to the country and say, I'm being blocked back me. I want, I want to leave. I mean, do you know what I mean? I, I can yeah, see no, what you're yeah. saying. There may be various parliamentary devices, and obviously we've all sat through kind of 
<laughs> terrifyingly mm. close votes over the last few months. But in the end, doesn't it just all bring us back to the same point? But which that's is, why I think Boris Johnson ought to go for an election. I don't before know if having to ask for an extension. Be before he's Because that weakens him. Yeah. Will he, would he ask for an extension, um, Tim? I could see him... I don't think he'll be asked, asked for an extension, but he may, of course, say, be forced by Parliament to ask for one. And then he can say, I tried and I was pushed into this. I, I don't think he'll ask for one voluntarily, because then he would be toast. Do you yeah. think there are as many Tory MPs, as has been discussed, willing to vote down a Conservative government on that basis? No. You don't? No. I, you know, how many times have we heard mm. all these numbers and then they never really turn up? Well, well, and, well um, we haven't actually got to the point, because the last time we came to this point, Theresa May accepted the reality, which is that she was going to, yeah. lose, she was going to be defeated by Parliament. And so, you know, she didn't want to do it, but she accepted that she would have to go and ask for an extension. It's true that we haven't got to that point. Exactly but, the same thing will happen to Boris. But um, I think there's still a possibility that uh, when, they've, when they're... Fa you know, this will be a newly elected Prime Minister mm. endorsed by the Conservative rank and file. And if Conservative MPs then well, vote... All 160,000 of them. <laughs> if, you wanna, if you want me to defend that, I will come <laughs> on to that. But I don't think you do want me to defend that. Uh, uh, get aside, but... I think it, if any, any Conservative MP uh, who then votes down the agenda that that new Prime Minister has just got a mandate for, they quite legitimately will face automatic deselection. Well, of course, but and, I mean, they don't and, care about and that. And that's they, the end of their career. But yes, some but of them are the already, country, aren't they? The country is some, but not many. Not 12. Oh, I think 20. You think 20? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. May, may I just pick a fight with Tim? Yes. This is a sort of do. Oh, side issue. Don't get up on me. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. But, you know, <laughs> since you've, you've wanted to introduce an element of division, <laughs> I thought I'd... So I listen to what you say about how Boris will govern as a one-nation conservative, and I hear this a lot from colleagues and friends who are sympathetic conservatives, but I can't think of a single person who's not already a Conservative who feels confidence in how Boris will behave once he's Prime Minister or that he will indeed be this one nation Conservative to bring the country together. And, you know, I'm really pleased that you talked about these interesting geographical changes that are going on in sort of almost churning of support between mm. the Labour and Tory vote because that's one of the most interesting things that happened in 2017. But it's a long way from that and from all of us agreeing that we liked Mrs May's speech on the steps of Downing Street about burning injustices, we just would have liked her to do something about it. It's a long way from that to Boris is going to be fine and he's going to unite the, the nation and therefore we should just all trust the wisdom of the internal democracy of the Conservative <laughs> Party, which is kind of what I feel yeah. like I'm being asked to do. Yeah. Well, look, I... I quite like Rory Stewart's candidacy. <laughs> yeah. Is that the answer to that question? <laughs> well, it, it, it's coming. Uh, um, and I could see how a lot of Rory Stewart's emphasis on... Uh, you know, it's, it's a more of a Birkin conservatism. Could, over four, six, seven years, produce a different kind of conservatism and a winning coalition. The Conservative Party doesn't have four, six, seven years. It has a few months. And the only candidate, we haven't mentioned Jeremy Hunt yet, and I think that's probably good because he's not going to win. <laughs> um, uh, Says but, the Boris Johnson supporter. <laughs> indeed. But Boris is the only person in this race who can reunite the Conservative coalition with Brexit party voters. And that is the primary first task. And then after that, it is the One Nation agenda that starts extending the Conservative coalition again. So I don't want to pretend that the, the reunification with Brexit party voters isn't the Conservative Party's first overwhelming priority. Right. But beyond that, Brexit, uh, uh, Boris Johnson is not just a Brexit party sort of uh, simple uh, caricature. He's a much more subtle character that I think will... Subtle? <laughs> that may have not been the best words to use. No, I wouldn't uh, say but, subtle, but even he, from an objective but perspective. But he's, a, he's a much more interesting Conservative. That mm. he, He's very different from Nigel Farage in 101 different ways. Well, and he will, mm. I think, he will extend the Conservative coalition in a way that... A, a Theresa May who narrowly mm. thought the Brexit was by immigration and imitating UKIP on things like foreign aid will not do. Well, what about Jeremy Hunt? Would he be better at negotiations with the EU? Would he be more likely to get, if he says one more time, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, but, it, but beyond that, if he were the person in charge? Well, I mean, what's he said that's different? He said he'll take the DUP and the ERG to Brussels with him. 
So the, that'll help. They'll make, <laughs> so they'll be in a bigger room, presumably. Uh, but apart from that, actually, there's not that much difference between them. Well, and I mean, he's prepared it, to be flexible about the 31st of October deadline. But reluctantly, we'll have no deal if it looks like there's But no it's also about how the EU views Boris Johnson and how they might view Jeremy Hunt. I'm not sure Jeremy Hunt's endeared himself to them of late with his Soviet no, Union. No, Soviet Union. To be honest. But, no, uh, no. And I think the EU doesn't... I think for the, for the EU, being legalistic is legalistic in all circumstances. It's, this is the law. This is the agreement. And I think, actually, we overstate how much personal animus towards Boris Johnson will affect the European Union. I don't think it will when you don't? the negotiations start. Uh, no, I think Jeremy Hunt would be, a, would be a much better negotiator. I mean, I just think he is a much more impressive details person uh, than, uh, th than Boris Johnson. I think he's much more focused. I, I, th I thought we saw that at, at the Saturday hustings. I thought he, you know, he looked like someone who was really hungry to be prime minister, whereas Boris Johnson actually wanted to be somewhere else. The only thing is the grassroots are probably still going to go oh, for yes. um, Boris Johnson. Can we just talk about the Labour Party a bit? Um, what's going to happen to the Labour Party over the next few months, Alan? Because you mentioned at the beginning, are they a party, or they need to decide if that they are a party of Mansfield or if they're a party of Islington? Mm. Um, and how is that going to be resolved? Well, I, don't, I don't think anything like that gets resolved before they've figured out Brexit. To be perfectly honest, I mean that's one of the things about Brexit is nothing else gets decided, so that's the debate to come. The first thing the Labour Party is going to have to do, I suspect, is have a summer of uh, fighting over anti-Semitism again, uh, which might be another reason why a new Conservative Prime Minister might think that the autumn is a good time to go to the polls. It depends how bitter that fight gets inside the party, but that's brewing up. And then, of course, the tone is shifting a little bit on Brexit, isn't it? I thought that letter from Labour MPs who were opposed to a second referendum was very, very strident indeed. Mm. I mean, the language really wasn't messing about. So it is perfectly possible, whatever they decide tomorrow, that the Labour Party has a summer of a very, very awkward internal fight amongst itself on a number of issues and isn't able to focus on, you know, the Conservative Prime Minister who's just walked into Downing Street. I think it's very clear which side will win, though. I mean, the point is, I mean, Tim talks about the realignment of, of politics. I mean, if Brexit isn't delivered, then the Conservatives are finished and there's no way back for them. Whereas if Brexit isn't delivered, then the Labour Party can always go back to its Remainer base and it will survive. The Labour Party will survive. Um, so I, th I think the two, part the two main parties are in, in a very different situation. If Brexit is delivered, does the Brexit Party collapse? Do we think it does? Do we yeah, think I, it goes? Do you I think, think it becomes a, a, a much smaller protest movement of, of, of Brexit purists against the surrender treaty, which it will call Boris yeah. Johnson's deal. I think Brexit in name only isn't the same rallying cry as betrayal. I, I don't know. There was a really interesting um, discussion between Douglas Carswell and Claire Fox on a podcast recently. And um, uh, Claire Fox was saying that if the establishment, for want of a better expression, well, that was her expression, had established um, had accepted Brexit, we would have left the European Union, but the essential nature of the British establishment wouldn't have been challenged. But the British establishment's refusal to take on Brexit and accept it means that now a wider regime change is on the agenda. And I think that is why I'm not sure the Brexit party is going to be easily unwound now. I think there is a abroad in the country now a sense that there is a set of people uh, in media, um, in uh, academia, in politics, in finance, in big business that really aren't that interested in the will of the people and that these people need to be overturned. Now, I think that's a minority uh, belief, but it's not an insignificant belief. And I think the, 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 the absolute opposition by a large section of society to implementing this result has created a, a distance between a large section of the population and that supposed elite that isn't going to go away quickly. Miranda? Um, mm. I don't think they will go away completely, but I don't think they'll be polling in these scary numbers that have got the Conservatives so spooked mm. at the moment. And, you know, Tim, actually, we should, you know, credit where it's due. Several years ago now, you said there aren't actually three parties anymore. There ought to be. Was it five even, you said? I think arguably six even. Mm. But, you know, I think that sort of anti-establishment right is now a, f a factor yep. in our politics mm. in the same way that the left has captured the Labour Party for now, but the left is now a factor that it wasn't before. 
I don't know whether John would agree with me, I can't believe in my heart of hearts that the Labour Party won't come back to its senses at some point. Um, also because I think taking that the, it's, it's, it's taking its time. time. <laughs> it really is taking its time. It's and it may 70. take... But, 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 well, no, because that's interesting, because it seems to me so much of it has rested on the cult of personality mm. around Jeremy Corbyn. I don't know how they quite sustain this. I know they've captured the party, but I don't know quite how they sustain this level of enthusiasm and grip once their beloved figurehead has moved on. Do you, you know? Can you have Rebecca Long Baileyism? I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's a thought. It's, it's isn't a it? thought. It's a thought. But you know what I mean. So I think there's all sorts of things on the move, and I think that. But I think wherever we end up. There will now be a left and a right in the way that there wasn't before and that the Labour Party and the Tory Party sort of absorbed and neutralised the left and the right in those broad coalitions. And it doesn't really work anymore. Uh, yeah, no, I completely, uh, I completely agree with you that, that Corbynism depends on the personality of Jeremy Corbyn himself. And it, as, uh, when he moves on, eventually, uh, something slightly different will replace it. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the Labour Party is not going back to to New Labour and, uh, and, and Blairism. I mean, I, 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 accept, I accepted that a long time ago. <laughs> have you? Uh, and I've have come you? out of mourning since. Right. Um, <laughs> but what, what, will, what will come after Jeremy Corbyn will be, will be different. I mean, it'll be much more left-wing than, uh, than, than the sort of the Labour Party that I grew up with, but it won't be quite as um, off the scale. It's worth bearing in mind, isn't it, that both parties have got real big policy fights to have inside themselves. I mean, the Labour one we've watched, but I mean, I remember being at a Tory event about a year ago when they were talking about agriculture, and they just tore strips off each other because there was, on the one hand, the camp that were saying, cut all tariffs, reduce all subsidies, cheap food. And the other side of the room were the people who were elected in uh, rural constituencies going, are you mad? Uh, and on policy substance now, there are, there are deep divides in the middle of both parties. I think if and when Brexit is out of the way, that'll be the next thing that happens. There'll be a struggle for the ideological soul of both parties, not just the Labour Party. I think I, think I disagree with that. I think, um, I think the agricultural debate is a subset of the Brexit debate. But I think okay. largely outside of Brexit, I think the Conservative Party is pretty united. But you look at the Labour Party, you know, oh. New Labour versus Corbynism, you know, whether it's trident or attitudes to nationalisation or tax rates or... I think the divisions go on and on in Labour. I think it's much more fundamental. I agree with that on foreign policy, absolutely. But I think, on, you know, the, the 2017 Conservative manifesto uh, was one which many Conservative MPs were less than happy with. They didn't see it as a Conservative manifesto. So, there's, you know, there are... But there are tensions, but I don't think they're as fundamental as between people like John... <coughs> Uh, John Rental and people like, um, you know, who are running the Labour Party at the moment. I think the Conservative Party beyond Brexit is a happier family than, than Labour. Even is. on an anti-austerity message that the Labour Party does rally round, most of certainly the parliamentary party. No, most of the Labour Party rallies around anti-austerity, but most of the Conservative Party rallies around fiscal discipline. But I think you look at... Although they were what, spraying quite a lot of money around in those leadership hustings, weren't they? Yeah, but that's, I think, partly because the deficit, deficit you know, is now down to a quarter of the level that we inherited when the Labour Party left it all in such a mess. Oh, well, let's not go back there again. Um, I'm going to open it up in a few minutes, so please think of your questions. I just Any final thoughts um, where we are going towards the summer um, about what may or may not happen, <laughs> without Theresa May, that is. Um, I think the next four weeks are crucial, uh, not because they will determine uh, who will be our next Prime Minister, that's going to be Boris Johnson. It's whether uh, Boris Johnson can concentrate on his transition operation, because this government will be, uh, this new, the new government that's heading our way, uh, will Boris have a good team around him or not? Will he have a proper US-style transition plan or not? Will he use the four weeks he has to liaise with Mark Sedgwell wisely? Or will he be distracted by, you know, Simmons Gate or however, whatever it is? And um, I think we should be f focusing a lot more on that than some of the things we are focusing on. Who, who's going to win between Joe Swinson and Ed Davey? <laughs> um, I think uh, I think Joe. Sw I'd be surprised if Joe Swinson doesn't mm. win. Um, and then, of course, it will be only the Labour Party that's never had a female leader, which will be yet another embarrassment for them. Um, <laughs> and I think that. 
you know, I think she's quite thoughtful, actually, about the way that politics is changing and the opportunities that open up in the centre, because for all Tim's, uh, you know, protestations, I do think the Conservative Party has a very, very fundamental problem at the moment, uh, you know, whether this mythical land beyond Brexit ever, we ever reach it or not, uh, I think is still questionable, because, you know, this is supposed to be the party of prosperity and of stability, and where's that gone, you know, with this hot-headed Brexit project and a bunch of radical revolutionaries running, running around, running the show. You know, and there is actually an opportunity there uh, because the Labour Party's abandoned the centre and so is the, so is the Conservative Party with the Brexit project. So if Tim's right and Boris constructs some sort of domestic programme that addresses, you know, social care, housing, the NHS, all, you know, the underfunding of schools, all of these things that we care about, technical and vocational education, you know, the most important thing that we should be doing... Then, then fine, you know, maybe you can mop that up again, mm. that coalition support. But if you can't, there is actually an opportunity for something in the centre. Are we heading no. for a constitutional crisis? Yes. I mean, I, I think Tim's absolutely right. I mean, the next four weeks are crucial, but, but that's because Boris Johnson has to, has to decide what he's going to do about Brexit. And he's got to decide whether he's going to go for an early election uh, in order to get a mandate to get it through, or whether there's some other way, um, which there isn't, um, of, uh, of getting it through. So if he, if, he, if he shies away from an early election, then he's heading for disaster because if he applies for an extension or if he's forced to apply for an extension uh, in October, then I think, uh, I think the sort of cries of betrayal that we've had so far um, will be completely drowned out by the... I mean, it'll, it'll be absolutely catastrophic, not just for the Conservative Party, but for the country as a whole. Yeah, on the constitutional crisis, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, at the moment, I see this as a political crisis but there are an awful lot of constitutional issues we're going to have to revisit, uh, particularly if we leave the European Union, about the devolution settlements and things like that, which might not be sort of full-blown crisis as yet, but are certainly things that we need to sort of think about. You know, devolution in England, you know, metro mayors in some areas, not in others. I mean, the, our constitution is a bit of a mess, and I think it's great. just processes... Uh, <laughs> it works. Well, it's shone a light, light on, on it yeah. and amplified yeah. it. Well, thank you very much first of all, to our panellists um, for that. Questions from the floor. Um, yes, just say your name and ask a, a, a brief question, the gentleman in the blue shirt, and then I'll come to you. And you. My name's uh, BJ Srao. Uh, with apologies to the member of the CSU here this evening, uh, wouldn't you say that the problem with um, this um, negotiation process is the attitude of the EU and the Germans when they indicated that the UK would get a punitive deal. And now wouldn't the Commission be better off to address Steve Baker's Brexit plan, which only differs from the withdrawal agreement by two or three points? I mean, wouldn't that be the way forward? I mean, basically, this is about preserving the Conservative Party now. Miranda? Um, well, I mean, I, I do agree with, with my colleagues here on the panel that the EU has been quite inflexible in some respects in this negotiation. And the problem about this idea of a punitive settlement is, you know, nobody's left the EU before. So, unfortunately, so there was... Uh, hang on, hang on. All right, don't, listen. Don't don't heckle too loudly from the side. But let's just concentrate on the UK. And Greenland isn't compared or comparable to the UK in terms of, of size and population. No, fair enough. I accept that. Sorry, Miranda. Go on. It's it's a you know it's a it's an unprecedented situation. And so this idea arose that you really at that point as well. It looked as if, for example, that Italy was quite looking quite enthusiastically some parts of Italian politics at leaving. And, of course, you know, in France, uh, Marine Le Pen was standing at the time on a pledge to, you know, put it to the French people as to whether they wanted to leave the EU. She's, she's since, you know, resiled from that commitment. So there was, there was that, that sort of, sort of fee feeling in the air. I mean, I very much agree with Anand that I think it's a shame, like a really a shame that, that we haven't had negotiations on both sides that have thought creatively about what a good relationship could be for Britain slightly, remo slightly removed from where we have been. And, you know, this sort of hollowing out of all the compromised territory, I think, is a terrible thing. I felt very, very sorry that the kind of Norway plus option died such a horrible death because it was hilariously killed off by the second referendum. 
the mites, you know, because actually, where is the whole EU going to end up over time? You know, you might well end up with a sort of integrationist core and then mm. other relationships, you know, that are not, are not the sort of France, Germany, Belgium, even well, the Netherlands is sort of, has sort of different views and obviously the, Sc the Scandies. So, you know, I think there is actually a more logical place in the long term for the UK than either totally in or totally out. But somehow that conversation has, been, has, been, has, not, has not happened. The gentleman here at the front, the microphone is just coming to you. Uh, name's Richard Galber. Talked a lot about different political parties. Brexit isn't a Labour or a Conservative Party issue. Mm. It's actually a bipartisan issue. So maybe there's two issues here. Maybe we need an election and another referendum at the same time <laughs> so that a question can be asked, do we want to leave the EU? If yes, the party that's elected to power, irrespective of who they are, must actually realize the wishes of the people. You have somebody like Yvette Cooper in government who is from a very leave constituency and she has done a lot to thwart a potential leave. And then on the EU side, you have another situation of a organization that has fought nine, there's been nine referendums that they've actually either ignored or required a second yeah. referendum on. They don't want the UK to, UK to leave. And then you've got Bernier, who is the first report I ever read on him, was that he was an Anglophobe. So he has fought. Just the comments on people from there. Right. So I mean, it's a comment rather than a question. I yeah. think I got there. Anand. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily the case anymore that they don't want us to leave. I think we've turned a bit of a corner mm. in that conversation now. And I suspect there are more and more people in the European Union who, who worry about how disruptive we would be if we stayed rather than hoping we did stay. Uh, I don't think either they've necessarily... I don't think the EU have approached this to be punitive. The, the EU have just approached this in their normal, rather technocratic, legalistic way, saying these are the rules, sign up or don't, with no... You know, the, the EU mantra is a third country is a third country. It doesn't matter who you are. You're just a third country like any other. And I find that uh, slightly limiting. The, the problem you have here is simply the numbers in Parliament. And... One of the questions is whether if you have another election, it changes those numbers significantly. Because what you might get if you get an election is a coalition that wants to keep us in, rather than a coalition that will take us out. So, but if you have a referendum with it, <laughs> to actually uh, require the party in power to live up to its... Management. We've had that. All right. yeah. I mean, that, people yeah. will say there has been a Leave Remain referendum. Um, the gentleman there. Thank you. Hi, thank you. A couple of points to you, Tim. First one, uh, just picking up on the notion that uh, the Conservative Party selected a Remainer, my observation was that the Leavers actually walked off the stage. And the second question is, you talked about uh, Britain being special. In what context do you think of it as special? <laughs> <laughs> There's two different uh, yeah. interpretations of that word. Yeah. Well, um, I think Boris Johnson did walk off the stage, but... I think he kind of walked off the stage with a dagger in his back and front from somebody else. I don't think he wanted to walk off the stage uh, three years ago. Andrea Leadsom, I was going to say. Andrea Leadsom also walked in yeah, she as yeah. a leader. Uh, and um, I think one of the regrets I had about Andrea Leadsom's decision was, and I'm very glad that we've got these hustings that are taking place now, is that I think Theresa May would probably have won in a contest against Andrea Leadsom. But over the 16 type hustings we're now seeing, mm, I think Theresa stayed. May's weaknesses would have been mm. shown up, that she wasn't the performer that Conservatives thought that she was. And um, I think if she tried to hold a general election um, uh, in the way that she did in um, June 2017... Yeah. Um, they would have known her that, I think a lot of her cabinet colleagues would have been saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. So do you think Boris, should go through the same, Boris Johnson should go through the same sort yeah, of scrutiny? And I, yeah, and I think... Um, I was glad that Gove didn't get through to the final round because I thought it would have been an ugly contest. I think, um, mm. I think as the psychodrama, as everyone uses that expression, I think it would have been a contest where Boris would have still have won, but he'd have had holes in him from um, Michael Gove. I think it would be a bit more collegiate, although this morning's time suggested <laughs> <laughs> I may be making a, a made a wrong... And, um, why, and why is Britain special? 
I think uh, Britain is special partly because of our, the various multiple relationships we have with the rest of the world, whether it's the Commonwealth, the transatlantic relationship, um, whether it's um, the Five Eyes partnership, whether it's you know, some of our internal ingredients, the quality of our armed forces, the universities, our creative industries. Uh, and our history, we've risen to, we've risen to uh, challenges again and again. And um, I'm, I think, I still believe, and I know this is a, probably a politically incorrect thing to say, but oh, I no. still... <laughs> can I go ahead? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think to be born in this country is still to have won the lottery in life. And I, mean, I, th I don't think you have to go that far to, to make the case that Britain's membership of... I mean, Brit Britain is different from other yeah. members of the European mm. Union. And, and, yeah. and General de Gaulle was, uh, was absolutely right yeah. um, when he said, you know, that... Well, uh, no. <laughs> the, reason, the reason he said no was that he said it's going to be very difficult to accommodate these mm. these Anglo-Saxons in our um, in, in our European project. Well, they did for turned quite a long time. Turned out to be right. Well, <laughs> well, it took a long time for it mm, to turn out it to be right. But, but um, yes, but um, it did turn out. To just be right. before I come to you, I'm sorry, the gentleman here. Well, I know the gentleman here, Tony Travers, and then I will come to you. Okay. Um, EU referendum three years on and nothing had happened. And nothing's not, not only has nothing happened in, in the matter of Brexit, but and this came up towards the end, none of the other policies that you might have thought would have been considered as a result of the Brexit vote have had any consideration at all. So to take three or four at random, they came up at the end actually, immigration policy not really discussed. Mm skills policy around the UK for many people, uh, devolution, an economic policy to match the trade deals that might come in the yeah. future, not a peep. And lots of things were done during the Second World War, existential crisis for the country, lots of planning. Politicians managed to do it, nothing. Now, here we have a four-week opportunity for two candidates to explain in some detail what they're going to do with all of these things. Do we think they're going to do that? John? <laughs> uh, I, I, I somehow doubt it. I mean, I do think, yes, I mean, we were talking earlier about the mistakes that Theresa May made, and one of, one of her mistakes was not to appoint a deputy prime minister responsible for uh, domestic affairs. I mean, her, she needed a Clement mm. Attlee to deliver her non-Brexit agenda. Or just, which, or just a radical chancellor. Mm. Or a radical, well, yeah, but it would have needed someone to do more than just be a mm, chancellor, direct, I think. Yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, she should have appointed an and because, I mean, for people who haven't seen his, his wonderful... Um, Great guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why you're on the panel, John. <laughs> <laughs> she should have done something about the buses. I mean, she should have just... <laughs> She should have. I thought that was poured, Jeremy Corbyn's policy. Poured, yeah, well, she should have beaten him to it. She should have delivered yeah. buses she for the working the class communities of the north instead of carrying on with this ridiculous HS2 project, which is going to well, uh, swallow think, more money into I, London. I think one of the most depressing things, I, I think this relates to your question, Tony, but is um, we've had the most extraordinary 10 years of modern politics, you know, since the crash where Miranda mm. rightly pointed us to a little while ago. Um, Political conventions are being overturned, mm -hmm. left, right, and centre. And nearly every newspaper editorial column, and every academic that I see appears on television, and every, every politician seems to believe exactly the same thing they did as they believed 10 years ago. You've got cultural, <laughs> technological, social, economic change all happening at the same time. To use Matt Ridley's expression, these ideas are making sex with each other, producing all sorts of multiple... Uh, repercussions, and everyone almost believes exactly the same. And I don't know if there's a programme for Joe in this, but... There must sit, be. Sit, sit, <laughs> no, to sit down with people in academia, central banks, and just say, what have you changed your mind about? You know, where, where, does, where do things need to reform? Where, where, where are the changes you need to go? Because I just see more and more entrenchment, and there's, there's such an intellectual dishonesty and a lack of reality about that. I think it's one of the most depressing characteristics of our, well, of our times. Well, it, it's interesting you say that, though. I'm sorry, yeah. Miranda, no, no, I'll come to you. Is that there have been numerous reports um, done, um, and they're not just worthy reports. They have been in-depth reports on everything mm. from social care to higher education to tuition fees to reform 
reform of the banking system, and successive governments have looked at these, they've commissioned them, and they've ignored them. them. All shelved. And shelved them, for whatever reason. So while I take your uh, point that, mm. that there hasn't been enough change, we haven't had the answers to some of those big policy questions. The work has been done to some extent, but either governments haven't had a mandate, or they have decided it's in the too difficult to do box. Mm. Sorry, Miranda. No, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, Tony's list or my list earlier, all these things are really urgent problems. Immigration has been talked about in the wrong way because immigration has been talked about within the prism of how can we kind of neutralise this political hot potato rather than what kind of immigration system do we actually need for post-Brexit or even, or even now. So even when they're addressed, they're addressed in the wrong way. Um, I think... Part of the answer is because another of our kind of imports from the US is not just this kind of incipient culture war that I dread so much, but also just this kind of permanent campaigning. So we've, 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 been, in a, we've well, been in an... 2014, we had the Indy Ref, the yeah. first Scottish independence referendum. Yeah. Then we had the EU referendum. We've had Labour leadership elections. Uh, we've had a general election. Two. Um, uh, t yeah, two. Yeah. 2015, 2017. It's just gone on and on and on. Well, I forgot the 2015 general election somehow. <laughs> no, and, and when parties are in campaign mode and when factions within parties are in campaign mode because of changing the leader... Nobody's thinking straight. Nobody thinks that they can afford mm. to be bi bipartisan. Nobody can reach out across the aisle, as they say in America. So I think that that awful thing of the permanent campaign we've been in since 2014 has really militated against doing deals on the things that matter. I think there's probably a deal to be done on something like social care cross party, but nobody feels they can afford to have those conversations. Mm. I think that's absolutely right. I and mean, I think, you know, the Tories have been engaged in a leadership contest since after the last general election. Uh, yeah. And that's, that, that hasn't helped. Uh, I disagree with Tim slightly in the sense that I think one of the things that has happened as a result of the referendum is the scope of our debate about policy has widened in a breathtaking way. I mean, we're talking about things. I mean, I realize nothing's being done. But that is an absolute problem for a whole variety of reasons. But actually, the debate about North versus South, about intergenerational fairness, about you know, infrastructure and investment is a completely different one to the one we were having before the referendum. Now, whether our political class is up to acting on any of those things, I think, is an open question. But I don't think it's true to say that everyone is saying the same stuff they were always saying. The gentleman there, um, by the camera, uh, if the microphone goes to him, and we've got time for just one or two more. Thank you. Um, my name is Guy de Jean here. <clears throat> right at the beginning, Tim Montgomery said that um, the polarization was about Britain's place in the ro uh, <coughs> role in the world. I'm sorry. Um, I, I seriously would disagree with that. I have not heard many people who voted leave, apart from those people in the sort of Brexit circle who um, argue it. And uh, if it is, then I think everything that's happened to date shows that Britain's role in the world, place in the world, is diminishing. The very fact we complain, people complain, that the EU isn't playing ball, but we're such a powerful nation. Where are those German car makers? <coughs> um, Travelling around the country, and I'm a Remainer, but I make a real effort to talk to Brexiters because I want to understand their position. What I hear is something completely different. This was, I mean, there were, first of all, there were many reasons that people voted leave. There wasn't one single one. Secondly, one of the most important was a feeling of disen disenfranchisement. And this is in England. This is an English identity crisis predominantly, not a British identity crisis. And it had to do with people feeling that they were remote from power, that they were being ignored. It had to do with the things that Miranda mentioned at the end, deteriorating um, social services and so on. Um, now, leaving aside the fact that every single reputable forecast um, shows, uh, predicts that Britain will be poorer as a result of Brexit. Whether or not we have a deal or no deal, Britain will be driven back to the negotiating table. And as someone who's followed trade negotiations in the EU for 30 years, I can tell you those negotiations are going to be absolutely tortuous, they will okay. last for years and years. They will be fractious with the EU, but more important, they will be massively divisive within Britain. They will pit interest group against interest group. They will tie everything up for as far ahead as we can see. 
All where right. Let, are we yes, going sorry. to find, just last yep. my question, where are we going to find the political energy, the resources, the space to deal with all those pressing issues that Miranda mentioned that actually drove a lot of people to vote leave? Tim. Well, well, well there's a lot in there. I probably won't be able to touch on all the things. But in terms of the divide, I think it's a very interesting thing you said right at the beginning. You didn't say, I voted Remain. You said, I'm a Remainer. And I think that is how a lot of people do see. It's not just an, for a lot of people an act that they undertook three years ago. It's part of our identity now. You see yourself as a Remainer. I see myself as a Brexiteer. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying I would call myself a Brexiteer. And that was the point I tried to make at the beginning. This has become an identity for us mm. much more than a one thing we did once. And that, that was the point I was trying to make about the division. Um, the point about whether we'll be um, more prosperous or not, I don't believe the economic forecast for a second. Any um, of them? Well, I don't, believe that I don't believe economic forecasts that the Bank of England make for a six months, let alone for five years or ten years. And I was at a dinner with Francis Maud two weeks ago. He used to be Britain's trade minister. He would sit at trade talks uh, at the WO as the trade minister of one of the world's largest economies, and he couldn't speak. He had to be, you know, we were represented by an EU trade representative who spent the whole time talking about manufacturing. Britain is not a manufacturing power, we're a services power. We will have a seat at the table in future trade talks talking about the industries that actually matter to us. So I'm far from uh, defeated on our economic potential. Do you think we'll be also, better, but do you think we'd be better off once we've left the Brexit, uh, sorry, once we've left the EU on Brexit? I think we're going through a temporary difficult divorce and it's more difficult than I thought it would be. But I think the EU is about to slip into a massive era of dysfunctionality. I think we see it more and more with every passing year that the EU is a system that cannot work. It's 27 member states on different right. economic and political cycles. It's going to get worse and worse. Well, it will affect us. We can't be isolated from it, but we're better off um, without it. All right, what do you make of the forecasts that have, by and large, official forecasts, Bank of England forecasts, government forecasts, that have said pretty categorically that the economy will shrink to some extent? Maybe, yeah. you know, beyond that in the medium term, the economy will recover in some way, but, but are they to be believed and taken seriously? Well, of course they are, yes. I mean, I disagree with, uh, I disagree with Tim, but I mean, I do think... Um, that the argument for leaving is not purely economic. And I think people are prepared no. to pay a price for a better Britain and for, for sovereignty. Well, the bank and, and, I think the the bank and the Treasury have been completely disproven, though, over their forecast about what would happen if we a, voted to leave. That was a very different thing, though. That was about the confidence effects of, of, of a vote. Yeah, Whereas this is, this is about the, the effects on trade, of putting obstacles in the way of trade. But, I mean, no, I, mean I, do, I do think we ought to acknowledge that there is no advocate on the platform for no deal. And I do think the gentleman's question was, was an important one, which is that in a no deal is actually a, it, it is a terrible option. I mean, even if you are in favor of leaving, um, no deal is not, I mean, it's not actually an option. It's just, it's just a way of saying, oh, actually, we give up. It's all failed. And, and, then you're, and then the next day, you're back, you're knocking on the door of the EU saying, can we talk about how we're going to do trade? And all the same issues will have to be resolved. So no deal is not an answer to anything. That's my, that's my point. I'm going to take two more questions, the gentleman here and then the gentleman there, because it is 8 o'clock. Um, yes. Yeah, hang on. Just wait for the microphone to come, to come to you. But yes, if we can keep the questions really tight and make them a question. Two points. Uh, one is uh, on the no deal thing. Um, these are the same people who said, like Blair, if we don't join the Euro, we miss the boat. Well, thank God we never joined it. Secondly, when they said if we leave the ERM, the economy will collapse, they actually recovered. And they also said if we vote to leave, the economy will collapse and unemployment will go rise. The opposite happened. So are you and happy to leave? With, would you be happy so to leave they, with no they, deal? Yes, I'm happy to leave with no right. deal. So it's the third time they've lied. If you lie three times, they're not going to believe you the fourth time. The second point is, first of all, why is no hardline Brexiteer, like the Brexit Party, not represented on this panel. And secondly, if Remain won this 52-48, why would they... Re they would not re uh, have a compromise, right. so why should we? All right, those are points rather than questions. So can I just go to the gentleman here, um, to the right first, and then, yes, and then, all right, I'll sneak in another one here next to you. Hi, my name is Lloyd Rees. Um, quite a few of the scenarios have ended up with us talking about there being a general election. But, I mean, that's not within the gift of the Prime Minister anymore. Parliament needs to vote for that. Mm. 
do we have a lot of MPs who are in threat of some of these insurgent parties actually not voting for there to be a general election? So is, does the deadlock potentially continue from that as well? Because it's not the out that it potentially used to be. Anand? All I would say to that is I remember I was actually in the House of Commons on the day they voted in 2017 to have an election. I was in a room with a bunch of Labour MPs. And as the division bell rang, one of them walked beyond me, behind me and whispered in my ear, Turkey's voting for frigging Christmas. Because they thought they were going to get hammered, but they also thought, if you're a politician, you have no choice. If the Prime Minister says, shall we have an election, it's a very, very bad look to say, actually, no, we might lose, so let's not. So I think... <laughs> so I think that's I mean, the problem. That's absolutely right. I mean, La Labour would have to vote for a yeah. referendum. <laughs> yes. So then all you need is, a, is, is enough Conservatives mm. uh, being asked by the Prime Minister to vote for it. And, and I mean, you don't need a two-thirds majority. You need a, a, a simple majority, mm. um, even though it might take a bit longer. You might need... I mean, that's why Theresa May took so long mm. over it last time. You might need to pass a short bill to change the date. Yes, finally. You with the microphone. Right. Thank you, you very much. The other question. Uh, oh, well, the thing is, yes, except it was, well, I'm not sure what the question was. It was the point. No, no, because we heard it. But if Tim heard and can reprise, um, then yes. Well, Tim. All, all I would say is I did vote for the Brexit Party at the European election. So I'm not, I'm not a complete um, wet or sellout. Um, um, <laughs> or maybe I am. Um, Who and, accused you of being so? <laughs> um, And I, I actually, contrary to what John said as well, um, if the choice is between no Brexit and no deal, I would absolutely choose no deal. Um, because I think, we ca I think the democratic catastrophe is more uppermost in my mind than the economic catastrophe. And for the reasons you stated, I don't think it would be the, necessarily the economic catastrophe that these experts say. I think it's more like a game of Russian roulette. Five times out of six would be okay, but a little bit like the fuel protest in 2000. We just don't know in the chains between our countries what could go wrong. And that's what frightens me. It would probably be OK, but the potential for real downside is, is the reason why I'd be cautious and want to prepare a deal. One question based, is that, mm -hmm. which is, one of the interesting things about the fuel protests is uh, the poll taken two days before those protests put Labour streets mm -hmm. ahead of the Conservatives, mm -hmm. you know, probably about 50%, about 20 points mm -hmm. clear. The poll three days after, we didn't, we didn't actually run out of fuel, we just had queues. Yeah. Had, it was the only time the Conservatives had a lead in that mm -hmm. poll. Yeah, I remember it well. Yes. Why would... A conservative prime minister risk that because well that's yeah. that's why I use exactly that analogy which mm. is what I would worry about that right. scenario okay um, I'm not recommending I'm mean, that's the sixth <laughs> that's the that's the sixth chamber in the gun all oh, right okay you know and what worries me about it but five times out of six I think we'd be okay, okay. gentlemen that thank you if Remain had won by 4852 they would not compromise so why should we compromise when Leeds won that's well, hang on. Can I, yes, I can Miranda. That, which is, which is that if, you're, if you've proposed and you win on an overwhelming upheaval and change, then the onus is on you is to justify and come up with a plan which hasn't, yes. hasn't been done successfully. If, if the side that was recommending the status quo... Well, I'm <laughs> delighted for you, sir. Stand, you, for, perhaps, parliament. Exactly, Stand perhaps, for Parliament. Stand for Parliament. Perhaps you should be our next Prime Minister <laughs> then, the third this year, which is probably quite likely that we'll have a third this year. But, you know, seriously, if, you, if you're proposing an enormous change, then the onus is on you to justify it and to, and to deliver it. If you, if you win a referendum on a status quo platform, which is what would have happened had Remain won, there would have been much less of a discussion because no, no, nothing would have happened. Mm. What I hope would have happened, by the way, if it had gone 52-48 the other way, is that we would have had a massive jolt to our politics that we needed and we would have been discussing all of these other things yeah. that we should be ta have been talking about for the last three years rather than talking about the Brexit mess. But it didn't happen that way. Um, right. <laughs> very, very simple, final question. Yes. Personal views put to one side. Is Britain going to leave the European yes. Union? Good, well done. That's a good final question. Um, Anna? Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> Can't do. It's not possible. Yes. It is going to leave. Yes. Maybe. Oh, oh, Tim. <laughs> so actually we had one maybe and two yeses and one no. And you, Joe. Mm. Oh, I'm not going to say. I, no, I'm not going to say. <laughs> um, listen, thank you very much. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you to the panel. <laughs>